unique opportunity to introduce Shannon. Um, she's joined the Climate Science Center here at ASU um, this last October. I've had the pleasure of inter interacting and working with um, uh, Dr. McNeely over the years, um, sort of thinking about um, trying to develop a postdoc uh, program here because of her unique skills of working in that interface between social and ecological comes from a social science background, uh, working in an interdisciplinary team um, at the University of Alaska, where they have an Iger team uh, there, where she can work with indigenous people with uh, looking at their response to climate change. And it's through that effort, actually efforts here in Colorado, while she was working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, looking at uh, water issues, Tampa River Basin, uh, initially together um, to thinking about this connection between climate change, natural resources, and people. And it's an area of great interest to me and a great um, area of importance to the Climate Science Center. So it's really a pleasure to have her on board. In addition to her work um, with her dissertation in Alaska, which we'll be talking about later, um, she also had the opportunity of working with Rosina Beerbaum recently <coughs> as part of the National Climate Assessment. And this area, um, dealing with the chapter on adaptation, is really also really important uh, for the research efforts we're doing within the Climate Science Center. So we felt really uh, fortunate to be able to um, ice her back to Colorado uh, to work with Jeff and I on this effort and actually to lead um, some of the research along this lines of sociological vulnerability and adaptive capacity. So it's our opportunity to sort of glean more of that insights and more detail of the presentation today. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So now for something completely different. This is probably going to be really different from what a lot of you are used to. I'm assuming because we're in an area, most people are in the kind of ecology realm here. Um, are there people that are not ecologists that are maybe social scientists? Well, there's at least a handfful. I see you back there, Ryan. Hi. From the next, yeah. um, and what about climate scientists? Are there scientists in the room? Why is that? So there's lots of okay. Uh, so that's good to know. Um, so hopefully I don't make your head spin too much with a whole bunch of terminology and conceptual stuff that you're not exposed to. What I really just want to do today is, is give you um, a taste of what it means to do this type of work, really focusing on the human dimension. So I'm an interdisciplinary, and like Jennifer said, primarily social sciences, but I'm also trained in ecology and climatology. So really doing a, a mixed method um, qualitative, quantitative, um, participatory approach. So I'm really going to talk about this uh, methodology, which includes um, the process of inquiry, which is participatory, stakeholder, interdisciplinary, social, natural sciences, along with um, some of the conceptual frameworks and the methods for analysis. Um, I've never quite presented it in this way. It's a little bit of a, a mashup, so hopefully it works. Because <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of go between the two as I talk through the process and the methodology. So even though these two locations, as Dennis said, I worked in the in the interior of Alaska and Yampa, and I'll, I'll describe those a little more in a bit. Um, they're they're really different biophysically. They're really different culturally. But the methodology I'm going to talk about and the analytical framework is largely the same that I use. Um, so with the caveat that when you work with indigenous peoples, as I did in Alaska, you have to be really extra sensitive <laughs> to some of the cultural issues like intellectual property rights and cultural differences and neo-colonial tensions and so on. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through these kind of four schemes and really how you sort of start a, a project like this, really focusing, you know, what to focus on from the social perspective especially. Um, not to downplay the ecological or the climate, but just because I think this is what I was asked to do is really kind of present from the so social sciences perspective. That's what I'm going to focus on primarily, but not solely. Um, then I'm going to talk about this integrative uh, vulnerability and adaptation climate change assessment, um, talk about the conceptual frameworks and the methods for analysis. Then I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the participatory research process itself, 
sort of going about working with closely with stakeholders. And then I'm going to talk about the really important thing, um, which is doing this type of approach, you've come, you've come to unexpected outcomes because you actually learn from the bottom up what people are experiencing, what the seasonality of their livelihoods are, what the, what the seasonality of their decisions are, and so forth. So the first theme is really how you go about understanding the system, so to speak, so this kind of coupled um, human ecological system. And really, you know, it might seem self-evident that you review existing literature, but what I want to emphasize here is that when you're doing this type of interdisciplinary approach, it's a lot of literature you have to review. <laughs> so if you're going to go down this road as a researcher, just know that it takes a lot of work. For the Alaska case, I had to really um, educate myself before going in about tribal issues in Alaska. That was really, really important to have some foundation of understanding of the culture I was going into. For the Yampa, I had to learn a lot about hydrology. I didn't really know anything about hydrology going in, so I had to do a lot of literature um, searching on the hydrology part. But you really need to understand kind of the, the social structure, so to speak, and how to what the, what the proper protocols and entry points are for working in these kind of communities. So really identifying nodes of leadership, um, attending the relevant meetings. So in Alaska, I had to go to tribal council meetings and really get to know them through, through that way and get their condoning of the project um, and partnership. In the Yampa, in the Yampa case, I, um, my entry point was the Basin Roundtables, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But it's also really important that while you are um, – doing this and learning all of this uh, about the context that the participatory approach is really about striking a balance of not predetermining what the issues are going to be ahead of time. Really leave space open. Uh, try and understand the system as best. Leave space open to actually co-determine with the stakeholders themselves what the key research questions are, what their key vulnerabilities are, and so on. And using the appropriate language in terms of in Alaska, I started working in Alaska in 2002. I started going to the, the tribal villages in 2003. At that point in time, believe it or not, they still, tribe, they still were not using the term climate change. They were talking about the weather, and they actually invited scientists there to help them understand why are we experiencing these changes in weather. So I really had to learn um, how to talk to them about that, how to learn some of their own language to be able to connect with them that way. The, some of the ways that they use words that are different the way we use words, even just the word luck, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, in the United it's northwest Colorado. As you all probably know, it's a very, very conservative part of the state. A lot of energy interests, a lot of old school ag interests, a lot of climate skeptics, and a lot of climate, climate change deniers. So going into that context, I had to really um, be careful to – depoliticized what I was doing. I actually, um, first presentation I said, I said, hey guys, look, I know you, some of you are concerned about this whole climate thing. I'm not here to, I'm here to observe and understand what you weather and how you're vulnerable, things like drought and water scarcity. Um, let's just take the not aspect of it. And an entry point, too, from a scientific perspective, let's really talk about the public structure. To talk about the fact that we know we're living in, um, we have been living in a much wetter um, time period over the last century, um, and that the region is actually a, typically a lot drier. And they really responded to that, and it was an entry point to really get their trust and buy in. And so the the um, you know one of the ways that you really get to understand from the ground up people experience you do interviews with locals to document their own observations of climate change and other environmental changes, ecological changes, um, understand what their knowledge and perspectives are and their experience with climate and weather and resource management. So I'm going to come I'm back sorry, to I'm sorry, can whoever please mute your phone? Yeah, I know. I don't know. Yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> so, 
So since I'm talking about understanding the system, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of each of these cases. So the first case is in what Systems as a whole. 
So it's really, really important in doing this type of work, and I can't overemphasize this enough, in understanding first and foremost what's going on now and what's going on historically in terms of their vulnerability and adaptive capacity for responding to environmental change, um, water uncertainty, climate uncertainty, et cetera. So I'm going to talk more about these concepts of understanding current exposures and sensitivities and historical. So when I say current, I kind of mean historical up until now, to understand how they've been vulnerable to date. And then what kinds of adaptive capacity and strategies they use to, they have used and they use now um, to respond to environmental uncertainty and risks. And then once you establish that, that baseline, so to speak, you can really be much more informed to start to look at future exposures and sensitivities, future adaptive capacity, future adaptation. So because a lot of these terms are thrown around vulnerability, adaptation, adaptive capacity, I'm going to go through the terms just for a minute because I think when you're doing this kind of interdisciplinary work, it's really, really important to say how you're using these terms because people use them very differently. And when you talk about exposure and, and sensitivity, when you're just looking at a species wildlife habitat, ecosystems perspective, um, in general they're similar, but the details are different. So vulnerability, as I use it, is really about social ecological susceptibility to harm. And it's about the combined exposure and sensitivity to climate disturbance. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk more about specifically exposure and sensitivity in a minute. But it's really, when you're looking at it from a human dimensions perspective, it's really about looking at food security, safety issues, health issues, environmental and economic and energy security. These are the types of things that we think about in terms of vulnerability from a social science perspective. So adaptive capacity is about potential. It's about natural, human, social, or institutional capital or assets, what people have to draw on when they experience some kind of climate disturbance or seasonality change. It's about having flexibility in both physical space and policy space. And by policy space, that really has to do with access, and ask, access to and influence on decision making. So what people are able to do within a regulatory or legal or policy setting. So when I talk about adaptation, I like to use the term sustainable adaptation because what it implies is a, a strategic decision making process to anticipate um, climate change that has the potential to disrupt key resource flows and reduce general well-being. And this last part is really what makes it sustainable adaptation as opposed to just adaptation. A lot of things happen and people adapt, but they're actually not good for the long run. Or they have dist distributional justice issues where it might be good for some people but not good for others. So that's why I like to talk about sustainable adaptation because it's more, this more kind of holistic perspective on how you actually think about a adaptation from a sustainability perspective. And then coping range. coping range. Coping range and adaptation are often also used interchangeably, and they actually have different meanings. Coping range is about the system's ability to cope with a certain range of climatic conditions. So that's what this is showing you right here. This is kind of a classic um, heuristic from adaptation literature, which really means that you know people have the ability to cope within a certain range of variability. But when the climate shifts, you start to get these events and these um, patterns that fall outside, these both kind of express the same thing in different ways. You get these events that fall outside the normal range of, of coping capabilities. So coping is really much more what I think of in the resilient sense, which is something big happens, Hurricane Sandy, um, the Colorado fires. How do people cope to get through that? Whereas adaptation is much more about being strategic to think about how is the climate going to change and what are we going to do to prepare for that change? So the, the, the difference is, is important from an analytical perspective, especially when you're looking at um, social systems. And just to make the caveat that I'm, I'm not talking about individual adaptations here either or biological adaptations. What I'm talking about is societal collective adaptations. That distinction is important as well. So this is the, ne the second sort of uh, source which is this Turner et al. paper that was in PDF. And by the way, if anybody um, wants any of these references, please feel free to contact me and I can send you citations or whatever you want. So 
So this is the Turner et al. thinking. This has had a big influence on the social science throughout vulnerability and adaptation, which is really kind of understanding from a systems approach, social and environmental um, interactions. So, you know, the ecological vulnerability and adaptation really comes in here. So it's a part of this much bigger, much messier <laughs> um, look at all of the drivers and causalities of vulnerability and all the sources of adaptation and drivers or adaptive capacity and drivers of adaptation. This is also really important to think about these differences in scale. So the blue is kind of the system of analysis that you're looking at. The, the yellow is the kind of larger region and there's cross-scale linkages between these. And while they might not be the focus of your research, at least understanding that they're there and, and the role that they play is really important. And then this is kind of the larger global um, system in which you have these drivers and feedbacks um, when you're talking about climate change. So the third part of this analytical framework, um, won't come up, there we go, is really about how you identify the key determinants of vulnerability and adaptive capacity. And this is when you start getting into the, um, the methods part, which is how do, you, how do you analyze this stuff? How do you collect data? How do you, how do you measure it or, or look at it qualitatively? And so you guys aren't going to be able to read all of this, but just to, to give you a sense of, so this is what we mean when we talk about exposure. And this is largely the same as what you've probably heard from other presenters in terms of exposure, the way they talk about exposure when you're looking at ecosystem vulnerability, which this is really the climate driver. So temperature and precipitation change, seasonality shifts, extreme weather, there are others that aren't included here. And then also land use change. Um, in other words, to take Hurricane Sandy since it's the most recent thing on our minds, you know, exposure is um, increased by people building in you know, floodplains, for example, or building in coastal areas where storage storms are, are increasing. So that's increasing your, your exposure. Sensitivity, on the other hand, is where it really diverges between ecological conceptions of sensitivity, which are focused, again, on larger species, ecosystems, you know, habitats, versus social systems. So what we talk about when we, talk, when we look at um, sensitivity of social systems is, like I mentioned earlier, is there a lack of options or resources or capital, whether that's financial capital, whether that's natural capital, whether that's political capital, institutional capital, whatever it is, and I'm going to get into detail a little bit more on the next slide on what that means exactly. Um, are we talking about politically marginalized or disempowered people? Um, you know, economically poor people, tribes are often, often marginalized or disempowered when it comes to issues of how you respond to um, environmental change. Um, are you sensitive because you have these degraded lands or ecosystems and multiple stressors or cumulative effects? So that's like, let's say there's another freak superstorm hurricane next week. Um, the people in New York and New Jersey are already sensitive because they just went through Hurricane Sandy. They're still trying to, to rebuild from that. So that's what this is about. And then vulnerability outcomes, these are just some examples. Disruption to ecosystem services, um, energy financial insecurity, health impacts or mortality, and reduced adaptive capacity. Oh, and also the relationship between exposure and sensitivity is really important here because in some cases, like I'll talk about in my Alaska case, you might have actually a, a, a small exposure from a climate perspective but because the sensitivity is very high, because whatever it is that, that that system depends on in terms of how they've adapted their system to their climate, um, a, a small change can have big consequences. So I'm going to talk about this more in the Alaska case. So adaptive capacity. Again, this, try not to let your head spin about this slide. There's a couple that are getting more that are going to be like this. So just, you know, try not to get too overwhelmed by it. But just to give you an example again of what we mean when we talk about human capital, this is really about, you know, how, what do people know, how much knowledge do they have about their ecosystem, about climate, about the weather patterns and what that means in terms of the experiences that they've had for long-term trends and so forth. Um, you know, how healthy are people? What kind of labor do they have? And risk perceptions, which is, you know, do people really understand climate as a risk or not? 
or do they view it as a risk or not, and how much? Because that influences then how much they think they need to do any kind of adaptation planning or strategizing. So natural capital, this is really much more about ecosystem services, which I won't go into because I have a sense you guys probably know the most about that. Physical infrastructure, that's pretty straightforward. Social and political capital, this is something we talk about a lot in the social sciences that, that's not really included in the ecological um, framework for understanding vulnerability adaptive capacity. And this is really about, you know, do people have the relationships in place and, and are they communicating well and is there a civil society in place where they can negotiate how to deal with these risks? That's it in a nutshell, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of scholarship on this topic and it's something that, you know, ecologists are really interested in ecological relationships. Social scientists are really interested in human relationships and that's where a lot of this comes in. Um, and institutional capital as well. So again, this is kind of, you know, in institutions like water, water resource management, for example, or conservation, natural, natural resource management in federal agencies. What kind of institutions are set in place in terms of are there flexible rules and regulations, for example, to um, respond to changing, changing seasonality or climate disturbances that might change habitat or might change um, species distribution or whatever it is? for analysis, just again to give you a flavor of how I go about doing some of this analysis. Um, and again, these are going to be some, some terms you, you probably aren't familiar with and some methods you're not familiar with, and that's okay. If you are interested and want to learn more about it, please, like I said, contact me later and I can give you some resources and we can talk more about um, how you might go about doing some of this work. But one of the main, t one of the main um, kind of approaches that I use is this grounded theory approach. And again, this, this goes hand in hand with doing this kind of bottom up analysis of social ecological understanding, um, which is really inductive in nature. So it's, 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 not, it's not hypothesis driven in the same way that you think of a kind of a typical conventional scientific approach. It's really about gathering data and then Coding and memoing. Memoing is really um, noting to yourself different aspects of what's going on in the data, and I won't get into detail about that. But it's really about theory building and then developing hypotheses and understanding networks. And what I mean by networks, and again, don't let this let your, make your head explode, but this is the kind of stuff that I do, which is the data, it, from the data, I derive these kind of connections in the systems and these relationships between these different nodes in the system. And this is a pretty complicated process that I can't possibly <laughs> explain to you right now. But basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to um, a, an easier to understand and communicate understanding about what's going on in the system and these relationships to ultimately do more um, kind of focused analysis on what some of the key drivers and dynamics are in the system that really need to be understood to understand um, vulnerability and adaptation. And this includes a lot of data, data iterations, um, not just with the team you're working with, because this, this kind of work really, uh, you need a team of people. You can't do this all by yourself because there's a lot of components of it. But it's data iterations between, for example, in Alaska, the interviews I was conducting with native elders and their observations of climate change. And then we went into the climate data to see what kind of patterns we were seeing in this region and really kind of under, letting them inform each other in terms of how do we look at this data? How do we interpret what we're seeing in this data um, from both perspectives? What does the climate data tell us that might 
um, enlighten us a little more in terms of what they're talking about in the interviews and vice versa. And then it's really about iterating this with the stakeholders. This is a mid, mid um, an interim report that we did in one of the villages I worked in. And this, this meeting in particular, we did it in a bunch of villages, but it was really, really important because we really rolled up our sleeves with these guys and sat down with my PowerPoint, and they were giving me information based on their observations, and we were, we were iterating back to them what we were finding from the climate data. And this type of approach is, is just, <clears throat> It's cumbersome, it takes a long time, it's, it's not easy to do, but it's so worth it because <clears throat> the outcomes that come out of this are, you, you would never expect it going in, and again, I'll talk about this more towards the end. And then you rinse and repeat. <laughs> so that's a good segue into, okay, so how do you really do this kind of participatory process? A lot of people talk about it. Jill does it really well, I know. She's done a lot of participatory. Well, you have, you have. She tries. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, sort of really interviewing and key informants and observing community interactions. Just some of the names of the methods that we use as social scientists, participatory rural appraisal, rural, rural rapid appraisal. Um, and this, I, I listed this here, this, this resource, because this is actually a really, really good little, little primer for working with communities. Not just it's, it's focused on indigenous communities, but it has a lot of really good for you know just kind of one on one. How do you do this type of participatory research? So I really recommend this if you're interested in this. But these are some of the things, the kinds of things you do in terms of really trying to understand people's um, seasonality and their climate vulnerability. <coughs> So let me go back. So one of the goals um, is to document, again, document local knowledge and understanding, um, understand livelihoods and how people relate to their natural world, and from their perspective, identifying their own sensitivities to environmental changes. And then another sort of aspect of this, it's just important to understand if you're doing this type of work, is there's a, there's a difference between um, participatory approach for adaptation and participatory approach to understand adaptation. And again, if anybody wants to talk to me more about this, I welcome it, but it's, it's really important <coughs> to know what your vantage point is going in. Are you going in to somehow influence what they do in terms of adaptation planning and adaptation strategizing, or are you going in to just understand and observe it? The latter being a much more kind of anthropological approach. Um, and then the former being much more what we're trying to do with the Climate Science Center. So this is also a really important point for doing this kind of work, which is the, the goal is not to, to confirm or correlate Western science with local knowledge and local observations. The, the goal is to really have them be complementary. It's, a, it's, it's this multi-methods approach, again, to really bring in different types of knowledge, different types of analysis, different types of understanding to get a better um, understanding of the whole. And, you know, I say this because some people in the scientific community really poo-poo local knowledge and traditional knowledge if it doesn't match, if you can't correlate it, um, you know, data point for data point with, uh, Western science, and I think that's a real travesty, and and you lose a lot if you have that perspective, because while they're both odd in many ways, they're also both very strong in many ways. And again, if you can really have the perspective of these, I'm I'm gathering these different data sources so they can inform each other, not because we want to confirm that the natives are saying the same thing as the climate data. So. When I say participate, I mean participate. <laughs> so in Alaska, this meant really participating in subsistence activities, such as the fall moose hunt. And the fall moose hunt and, and climate changes, fall seasonality changes on moose is what I ultimately focused on in terms of the, the ecology, conservation, ecosystem services perspective. And I got to that point by doing this. <laughs> this is me butchering a moose. Apologies to any of the vegetarians or vegans in the room. Um, with <laughs> one of my native elder mentors, this is Eliza Jones, and she actually wrote um, their, their Koyukon Athabascan Dictionary. It was 20 years 
of work. It's an amazing piece of work. It's this fat. Um, but it really required, you know, doing this kind of what, what you could call an ethnographic approach to participatory research really requires this, getting your hands dirty. Um, so I lived in and worked in these villages for relatively for years, weeks and months at a time, through all seasons, over a course of about six years. In the Yampa White region, it was a much shorter project. I'm still not actually done with it, but I still, it was the same thing. It was living there for weeks, months at a time, visiting, revisiting, getting to know people, building their trust. It's really important to build their trust so that they know that you're not going there with an agenda, but you're really going there to learn from them. And so this is just a conceptual way to think about this type of work. So really, what it requires is going in from the beginning, you know, after you do your sort of homework in the beginning, is having these really kind of broad research questions. So for me, it was, you know, what are the environmental changes people are experiencing in this region? Um, you know, what, wh who is vulnerable where and when and why? Those kinds of big questions. And then through the, these processes that I talk about, interviews, um, you know, you refine your question analysis, the multiple stakeholder dialogues, interim presentations are key, you refine your analysis, and then this is really important, stakeholder verification. So giving back to them and saying, here's what I came up with. What do you think about this? Um, presenting that to the stakeholders. And then you publish your final results. And just a, a quick note about public forums, because a lot of people rely on public workshops and meetings to do this type of, what they think they're doing is social science. But when you're working in, um, when you're working cross-culturally, which is really in any culture, <laughs> because frankly, there's no culture like the scientific culture. We're, we're a minority <laughs> in the world, so really going into any community is cross-cultural. Um, there's a lot of power dynamics that happen in public settings, whether or not those are cultural taboo issues if you're working with indigenous people about what they can and can't say in public or how they say something in public um, versus gender issues, what a woman might be able to say or not say when men are in the room and so on. You have to be sensitive to the fact that public forums are one way to collect data, but they're usually not the best way. They're certainly not the only way. They're a stepping stone. So I just, I wanted to say that because um, I think a lot of people who are getting into this type of work really re rely explicitly on their human dimensions part being big public meetings. And I don't think that's good enough. So now I'm going to get into some of the details about the outcomes. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, good. Okay, that should be enough. <laughs> yeah, that should be enough. I hope. Um, so in Alaska, when I first started looking at the climate data in Alaska, we were looking at this. I was working with Martha Schultz, who at the time was, was um, one of the leads at the Alaska Climate Research Center. She's now one of our collaborators at the High Plains Regional Climate Center at UNL um, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, these were the kinds of outputs that she was doing, and these were really informative in terms of the, of the trends that were happening. Um, a bunch of different stations throughout the region, broken down by region. This is my region, the interior region. Um, you know, winter trends are significant. I mean, we're talking about some, this, this is like a, what is that, 50 plus, almost 50 year trend. We're talking about some stations showing almost a 10 degree temperature increase in that amount of time. That's pretty significant. Um, and then followed by springtime change, summer and autumn. The interesting thing about this autumn record was that it didn't show a heck of a big change. But yet, by working with communities, what I came to understand was what they were dealing with in real time, their most important issue in terms of vulnerability was the changes that were happening during the fall season, the early fall season, and how that was affecting moose behavior and how it was affecting their ability to successfully harvest moose within the regulatory window that they now have to abide by. So a lot of the regulators and scientists were scratching their heads like, what's going on? Because there doesn't seem to be much of a temperature change there. Why is this? Why, why is everybody talking about this moose um, change due to climate changes, due to seasonality changes? 
And actually, just to, just to, to back up a minute, when I one of the things that's going on, as you may or may not know, in the interior of Alaska and, and really through the Arctic and subarctic as a whole, is permafrost melt. And in this particular region, what permafrost melt does is it changes the, you know, it's a lot of um, saw lakes and oxbow lakes. It's re a ton of lakes in this region. And what it's doing is it's drying up a lot of the lakes over time. Some areas it, it increases them, depends on the subsurface gradient and what's going on hydrologically and all geomorph geomorphologically and all that. But I thought going in that this is what I was going to focus on, was lake drying. And as it turned out, this wasn't really actually that important to them. So this is really to emphasize the point that, you know, you might go in with this, these scientific hypotheses about what you think based on the science are going to be the most important issues. But when you look at it from a social perspective and you look at it from a social ecological perspective, it might not be that important if you want to influence decision making. So as I said, it was really this moose issue. Um, I actually took this picture. This is on the Yukon River. That is a moose head right there in the front of this boat. Um, you know, they hunt by rivers primarily. And what's going on there is in warmer falls, which isn't every fall because climate change, as we know, is not linear. Um, in warmer falls, the, the moose, and I, it's not just happening in Alaska. I know this is happening elsewhere, but I think it's, it's particularly more observable there because people are so dependent on it for food security and because Alaska is one of the fastest growing places on Earth. The moose get hot, they can't thermoregulate, they stay back up in the hills, they stay back in the lakes, and because they hunt by boat and they're really reliant on hunting by boat, I'm sure most of you saw Into the Wild when he killed that moose and he couldn't do anything with it because he was in the middle of nowhere and got hot. That made me laugh because these people would just, I mean, he would get laughed out of the village if that guy tried to do that with these guys because that is really critical to them that the temperatures are right, that they can access the moose because the water levels are right, and that the moose are actually coming out and starting their rep behavior. That means calling, that means moving around, that means fighting, looking for their mates. That's how these guys are able to find them. And so in warmer falls, it changes the moose's behavior, which thereby changes their ability to access the moose. So what was really important, so this issue of seasonality, because this is the conventional way that we think about seasons. We think about them as four, three-month seasons, right? Well, in Alaska, in this particular region, seasonality is much, much more nuanced. And I'm going to actually get to some images of that in a minute. But early fall and late fall are, are characteristically very different. And we're talking about months that span August, September for early fall. And then in October, November, when the rivers freeze up and it becomes late fall into early winter, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that's going on in the system in terms of how the ecosystem is responding to seasonality change, in terms of how the people are responding to seasonality change. So what was important for us to do was really to dig into the data and slice it in a way that matched up to what they were experiencing. So again, getting back to how these different ways of knowing and understanding the system that did this, that, and, I, and I won't go into the details. I think you guys might have gotten the first few that I wrote on this, and if not, I can send them to you. But that goes into more detail about wh what we needed to look for in the data and what it told us about when the climate had actually shifted because the temperature pattern had gone out of the, the standard deviation of variability. So it was outside of the normal range of um, seasonality. So I'm going to kind of race through this, so hopefully it doesn't make your head explode, just the next couple of slides. But there were just, you know, when you do this kind of systems perspective, you really need to understand um, what it is that, that from, a, from a human dimensions perspective, is important to people. So this, I mentioned luck earlier. So these are the kind of the, um, the causation factors for luck. Huskarni is a is a quite kind of Athabascan word. It has to do with taboos and self restraint. It's an idea that's similar to the idea of karma in Buddhism, which is luck is not fatalistic, um, but rather it's it's a cause and effect relationship. So your your behavior towards your environment has a direct causality of your luck in harvest. So, but they know it's also not just luck of their behaviors, but it's luck of the weather conditions. 
actually there's more to the story because they feel like behavior influences weather and climate change too, but that's another story. So encounters, when, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so encounters, you know, these are the, the kind of on the ground issues, the regulatory season when they have cow hunt closures, money and resources, moose population, density, so some of the biological and management issues. But then you've got temperatures and bull movements, visibility through the trees. So that's another, um, you know, access encounter thing is can you actually see them? If the trees aren't off the leaves yet because it's warm, your visibility is reduced. So on down the line, again, access, water levels, um, and, and then this regulatory piece really was important to understand. And then meat care, back to into the wild, you know, are the temperatures warm enough that the meat isn't going to rot? Because it takes a lot, meat, moose are huge animals. It takes a lot of time to butcher it, get it in the boat, get it back to the village. It's got to be cool enough. So these are all indicators, climate indicators, that tell them whether or not the conditions are in the normal range of variability. So this graphic is really going to make your head explode, but this is just to kind of demonstrate. So this is the regulatory policy stuff that I had to understand. And I can just tell you that it took me a good five years minimum to understand this, and I still don't fully understand it, and most of the people working in the agency still don't understand it. So, but just to give you an idea of everything that, that is at play, so this is kind of the hunters, and I know you guys can't read this, but these are the different hunter populations from local village folks to outsiders, whether you're a state um, Alaska resident or not, because that determines what kind of permit you can get and where you can go and so on. Um, I can't even read this now. Oh, the decision-making body. So these are the decision-making authority for the state. So this is state and this is federal. Federal Subsistence Board, the Alaska Board of Game, and how these are connected, where the, where the authority and decision-making power lies. And then the top one is um, wild, Wildlife and Subsistence Regulations, so the Alaska state laws, the U.S. Um, federal laws. And, and the Wildlife and Subsistence Management in Alaska is a dual state, state federal management system that is nothing short of Byzantine. So it's really, really complex. But this is at the heart of when and how they could, could adapt, because this determines where and when they can move across physical space, like I said, and policy space within that regulatory window. So just kind of going through this. Um, oh, this is land ownership, the state, private, native corporation, federal lands, um, and so on. I'll just but this is what I had to ultimately understand, was this web of how these things all related to each other in terms of how they were constrained by what they could do to adapt. So they have, you know, their own traditional adaptive capacity in terms of how they traditionally adapted. Them. But now they, they're forced to live in this mess of land tenure and nat natural resource management that binds them. So the issue was, while the seasonality is changing in terms of the moose behavior and when they can find the moose and when they can harvest the moose, the regulatory system stayed here. And so it was this tension between their petitioning the government, both the state and the feds, to change the regulations to give them more flexibility and the biologist's opinion, which is this moose population is a conservation concern, we want to keep the population up, we don't want you to hunt during their breeding dates. Not to big story of my dissertation. You can read it if you want. Um, <laughs> so just back to the, to the seasonality um, and, and the participatory approach. So this is actually a, a, a hand-drawn diagram by one of the guys. That meeting I showed you in the beginning that I said became a really important meeting for our feedback, one of the guys, he's in his early 20s, um, Travis Cole, he went home. We had a conversation after the meeting about you know, what's, I, I really want to see what's the visualization of your seasonal round, the seasonality. We were talking through all these issues. So he went and annotated this seasonality, this clay cup seasonal round image. And then I hired a graphic artist to do this, which was to expand it to include their terms for the seasons. And this poster um, will eventually be at the Climate Science Center if anyone wants to take a better look. I think it's in a tube I just brought back to my own car lab. Uh, office, I'm not sure. Um, and what they're doing, their their names for the seasons and for the months are actually, their, their native names are actually based on what they are doing on the landscape and what the e ecosystem is doing. So again, understanding the seasonality 
was central to understanding vulnerability and adaptive capacity in this region. And then this is the final poster. So this is the full integration. These are all the elders I interviewed. Um, this is the full integration of some of the interviews and the analysis that we did based on these interviews and how we understood how seasons had come out of balance in this region. So the Yampa White Basins, um, since I'm running out of time and since this project wasn't as lengthy, I'm going to kind of fly through this. But some of the issues that they're dealing with that probably a lot of you know, um, in terms of exposure, spring change, early runoff, um, chronic drought that they've been dealing with in the early 2000s and now again in, in this decade, um, water availability issues and the projections that, um, you know, the, the, the demand doesn't meet what the availability is going to be, and there's all kinds of science going on about this, as I'm sure you know. And then their sensitivity really is around these um, industries. Agriculture, it's a ranching community, still primarily um, their economic driver, energy, as I mentioned, and rec and tourism. And I should have added conservation, because that actually um, plays another big role. They've got a stretch of the um, Upper Colorado Fish Recovery Program in the Yampa River, so there's four endangered species of fish in a stretch of the Yampa. Um, and this is just an image, I, I really like this image, because this image is taken from Carpenter Ranch, which is a nature conservancy property in that region. You've got kind of, it's still a working ranch, so it's a conservation property, they, they harvest hay there, and then you've got the Hayden coal plant in the back, and then if you squint really hard, you might be able to see Steamboat way back there. So this really kind of encapsulates all of the, the cross-sectoral issues that, that they're dealing with that they have to try and figure out how to adapt given these projections of water <coughs> scarcity and climate change in the, f in the future. So again, this is what, I'm, what I've been really interested in, is understanding the culture and the worldviews, how people perceive risk in that region, because a lot of people don't perceive climate change as a risk, um, livelihood strategies, and how they're adapting in terms of water resource management. So one of the interesting and, and somewhat surprising findings about this region, because people think about the Yampa Basin, they think, oh my god, there's tons of snow, you know, the Yampa River is one of the least regulated rivers in the state, so they've got all this water, they're so hydrologically rich, they don't really have a lot of vulnerabilities, but they actually do, and what, what was interesting about this story is this was um, my analysis on what happened in response to the 2002 drought, so one of the things I was looking at is Looking at the 2002 drought as an analog for water scarcity, how were people vulnerable, where were the hot spots, who was vulnerable, where, when, why, all that stuff, um, what kind of adaptive capacity did they have, what kind of coping response did they have, and did, did they set any adaptations in place to deal with future climate change and water scarcity. And one of the really interesting stories that came out of this was they still have never, the AMP is known for still never having had a legal curtailment call on the main stem of the AMPA River. And part of the reason they've been able to do that is because they have a lot of really strong social capital. In the 2002 drought, they were actually able to negotiate their way out of a legal call. Though, with that said, the thing that brought them closest to the call was energy and the water energy nexus. And here's why. Because the tri-state power plant, which is just south of Craig, started running out of water. It's a coal-fired power plant. They have to have water to keep the power on. They started running out of, out of water towards the end of the summer. The city of Craig started running out of water towards the end of the summer. The water commissioner told the city of Craig that he was going to have to curtail them to shepherd water from the Elkhead, actually not from the Elkhead Reservoir, from the Stagecoach Reservoir, which is actually in the ne next map, which is way down here. It's about 60 road miles from the power plant, which the Yampa runs along, along the road. So it's about that in river mouth. Um, they had to shepherd water all the way from stagecoach to tri-state power plant. And even though there wasn't a formal, formal call, they did have to administer the river, which meant they had to shut down a bunch of people um, so that they could get this water that the energy company owned and was calling for out of the reservoir to tri-state power plant. They also have Hayden power plant in the region. And so the real story, in the 2002 drought was it was about this water energy nexus in that the Hayden power plant also started running out of water. They were calling for water out of both Steamboat Lake and Stagecoach Reservoir. Um, and this is what nearly kind of reached a tipping point for them because really when the power goes out, everybody's kind of screwed, right? So <laughs> that was really the thing for them. 
Um, what the, an adaptation that they set in place since is, is they've, they've expanded Elkhead Reservoir, and that was actually in response to the programmatic biological opinion for the end, endangered fish. But that actually has the co-benefit of providing water not only for the power plant and for the fish, also for the municipality, also for the ranchers. And there's actually been some really interesting innovations that have happened in the basin um, with that expansion and with some water leasing that's happened. And I, I need to follow up and do more research because a lot of this manifested with the 2012 drought. And I've been away, so I haven't been able to, to follow up. But that's going to be my next step of this research. But again, you know, I would not have understood this had I not spent the time with the stakeholders doing the work that I did. And this is really critical, and it's not just critical for the Yampa Basin. This is critical for a lot of the West, um, this water energy nexus issue, because it takes water, water to make energy, it takes energy to move water around. And so this, to me, is one of the most important issues that we're going to be dealing with in terms of climate change impact. A lot of the adaptations, this is my last slide, a lot of the adaptations that have been put in place are because of this, the basin roundtable process. So this is the other thing that I'm, that I'm writing about is the statewide basin roundtable process. But this is really where these folks negotiate these issues. And what I call an adaptation in process, and it's not specifically for climate change, but because it's water resource management and because climate is so um, integral to understanding future projections. So these are a lot of skeptics at this table. It's not just because they're from throughout the whole basin. So you've got people from Liberal Route County, Steamboat, you've got people from Craig, you've got people from Rangeley. But by and large, these are ranchers um, and uh, energy coal industry people. But they actually have to include climate in their negotiations. And so it's really fascinating to look at how are they understanding climate as a risk? How are they including it in their basin assessment needs studies? And how are they preparing for the future? So those papers I'm working on, and they'll be published hopefully in the next six months to a year. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously that's that's the goal. I mean, that's why you do this kind of work. Um, both of these projects, I would say, especially the Alaska one, the Yampa one is still in process, and since I'm now at the Climate Science Center, it's probably going to change in terms of is, is it really the of or the for sort of question. Um, you know, you, you hope that it helps inform them of the, especially the climate piece. I mean, I think about climate and, and about this kind of human dimensions work as making the unknown known, making the unconscious conscious. And in a lot of cases, that's just doing this kind of stuff, is documenting, okay, what happened? I mean, the fact that um, in the Yampa Basin, that I was able to give them a full picture of vulnerability throughout the region, None of them had that full picture. The closest thing would have been the division engineer and the water engineers, because they're the ones that are actually on the ground. But even still, the, you know, the, the division engineers are sub-regional. The water engineer was actually new since the 2002 drought. So I was actually the only person that had done that full picture in this way. And they really appreciated that. Um, I know for a fact, because they told me, that some of the skeptics I actually influenced in terms of whether or not they felt that they needed to think of climate change as a risk. And I had those people tell me that they think that I had an influence in general. 
without, you know, I'm a social scientist, so without actually measuring it and trying to understand it and observing it, I can't say for sure. But I, you know, I think so. And I know in Alaska that that people in the agencies and the tribes have used my work um, for, you know, continuing to negotiate some of these issues and understanding climate in the region. So. That's a drink we should have over a glass of wine. <laughs> um, it's yeah. I mean, it's hard. It it is really hard. Both of these cultures are still very male dominated. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it is an issue for sure. Um, in some ways, I think it, it gives you an advantage to be quite honest, because in some ways you're less intimidating. I think. Especially if you go in with the approach that I did, which is I'm here to learn from you. I'm not here to tell you what you need to do and tell you how ignorant you are about the science. You know, I'm here to co-produce research questions and knowledge with you. But yeah, gender issues are, I mean, it's, yeah, especially in the, the rural villages, there's um, there's been some stuff that's happened out there with women researchers. So you just have to be really careful and really strong. <laughs> Wondering about the issue of uh, on uh, issues of climate change when they don't that it's happening. It happens. Deniers. I would say, like I said a minute ago, I would say that that's true more so with the quote unquote skeptics yeah. than the, than the full on deniers. The deniers, I probably didn't change that much. Although I gotta say, there's there's one in particular in the on the Yampa Roundtable, full on denier, um, and very vocal about it. And um, he would come up to me at the roundtable meetings and be like, "How's your research going? Oh, great, you know." So. It's hard to say, um, but I know, you know, the, the skeptics in the region, they actually have a lot of really good arguments. I mean, they're not just ignorant. They have concerns, not just from an economic perspective, but really questioning the science and understanding how to question the science in that, you know, we don't really have a firm grasp on projections of precipitation and snowpack at this point on a scale that matters to them. Um, and they're pretty smart about that. And so, you know, it gets down to this risk issue, which is a whole other um, body of work that I am writing about, which is cultural theory of risk and, you know, what people think is risky and what people don't think is risky and how their worldview informs that. But I would say there were, there were definitely a handful of skeptics who I got to know really well. Some of them became really good friends of mine. I mean, we still call each other on phone and, you know, I mean, email and so Facebook, you know, so, um, so I would say that that I definitely had an influence, but the, but their skepticism is actually really valid in a lot of ways. And so, um, I mean, my one of my sort of take-home messages when I gave my my last presentation to the roundtable on this was, you know, whether or not you believe climate change is human caused, it really behooves you to understand this stuff really well, and to not just fight it, but to really understand the science as best you can because it's going to influence these big decisions, whether you like it or not, you know, in terms of the, uh, if there's a trans, if they're a basin of origin for a trans species or a front range, for example, um, you know, how energy development takes off in that region given water scarcity issues, things like that. And they, they, they totally agree, you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, some people just aren't going to believe it no matter what, and it's a small fraction, and there's not much you can do about it, so. <laughs> I thank you for this question.